Hi, I'm Blake Ray, and I'm here with Jason Haas, and he is a partner and general manager at Tavis Creek Vineyards in Paso Robles, which for my money is probably the best and certainly the most influential winery in uh, Paso Robles. Uh, Tavis Creek was, uh, was ahead of its curve in bringing in quality Rome varieties to uh, California. Um, and uh, a lot and had a nursery and proliferated some quality uh, Rhone grapes throughout the state. And a lot, if you have a, a Rhone blend wine, even if it's not from Talos Creek, you might have Talos Creek to thank for it. So uh, Jason has just been blending today, which is one of the most important things that people who make Rhone style wines do, because most Rhone style wines are not single variety wines. They're they're better when they're blended. So, uh, Jason, why don't you tell me about uh, the blending? What you were trying to accomplish today? Sure, um, and thanks. Thanks for all the thanks for all the nice stuff you said in the intro. Um, so, yeah, Tablas Creek, we're really a blend house. Um, we do make varietals. We'll bottle several varietals every year, but like eighty percent of what we make is blends, and that's in keeping with the tradition that we follow. We're co-founded by the Perrin family from Chateau de Beaucastel in Chateau Neuf du Pop. And in Chateau Neuf, there are, depending on how you count them, 13 or 14 or 19 different grapes that you can use. And almost every Chateau Neuf du Pop, whether it's a white or a red, is a blend of at least a few of those grapes. So um, we, at this point, have almost the entire Chateau Neuf collection in production at Tablas Creek. There's only one that we've planted but haven't yet harvested. That's Muscardin. But that means that we've got, for whites, we've got Roussan and Viognier and Grenache Blanc and Marsan, Bourbonblanc, Picpoul, Picardin, Claret Blanche. I think that's it. Um, and then reds, we've got Morvedre, Grenache, Syrah, Cunois, um, Terry Noir, Vacarez, and Senso. So you have a lot of you have a lot of starting points. And the way that we go about blending them is we start by tasting each of the individual lots. We harvest everything separately, we keep it separate through the fermentation process because we don't feel confident in our ability to decide where a particular lot of grapes is going to be best at harvest time. We want to wait until it's done fermenting so we can evaluate it. So we've been working on whites this week. Um, and we had 37 different white lots to, mm. to, to choose from or to start evaluating. Um, I actually brought home the sheet that we start with. So I'm going to hold this up so your viewers can see it. So this is um, half of them. Here's the other half. Huh. Um, so each of these are lots that we have had separate since they were harvested in September or October of last year. Um, and our goal up to this point has basically been get them through fermentation in good shape so that they can be evaluated properly this week. So on Wednesday, we got together and the, the six key people, it's a little bit of a smaller group this year because the parents are not coming over from France to be a part of this. And we wanted to make sure that we maintained good distancing as we were blending. So we limited it to just the core group. So um, it was me, um, Neil Collins, who's our, our head winemaker. And he's from England, right? Top assistants. And then our, our viticulturist. So it's just, just six. And Neil is from England, right? He is. Bristol, England, of all places. It's a really unusual place for a winemaker in California to be from. It, it is. It is. Most people assume he's Australian when they hear him, just because they can't wrap their heads around the idea of a British winemaker being in California. <laughs> but anyway, I cut you off. So, so you're making the white today. And of course, I have a bottle open of the Esprit Blanc de Tablas. And this is your highest end white blend. But it you, is. you make more than one white blend. We do. So um, in the blending process, the first stage is to taste all of these lots, like the, the paper that I just showed you, um, and give them all grades. So we don't have a very complicated grading system. It's basically one, two, or three. One means it's rich, it's powerful, it's balanced, it's fresh, it has good elegance, it, it's appropriate for the variety. That means that it is of a caliber that we will consider for the Esprit Blanc. Um, two means we like it, but it doesn't feel right for the Esprit. And that can be because it may be pretty and fresh and friendly, but not have enough concentration, or it might be so dense and intense and varietal in character, we don't feel like it's going to blend very well. We have to like it. Twos we like. Threes mean there's an issue with this that we feel like we need to pay attention to. Maybe it's a little oxidized or a little reduced or 
um, not done fermenting yet, something that needs attention in the cellar, or maybe it's just something that we feel like um, it just doesn't have the concentration and interest to go into one of our wines, in which case it gets sold off and never sees a, never sees a Tablas Creek label. But that's the first stage. First stage is give it grades. That, that was Wednesday's work. So then yesterday we got together and started on the Esprit Blanc. So we had done a little bit of brainstorming at the end of the day on Wednesday to try to figure out, based on what we were tasting, does this feel like a vintage that should be an unusually high amount of anything? This is a wine which is almost always, it's always based on Roussan. It's almost always over 50% Roussan. It's been between 60, 55 and 75% in recent years. And our, our evaluation of the Roussan this year was that the Roussan was really good. So we were probably looking at a fairly high percentage of Roussan. But that Picpoul was unusually good, Grenache Blanc was really solid, and we liked both Picardin and Claret Blanche. So there were five grapes that were in the mix for the Esprit Blanc. Um, and we came up with three different um, kind of provisional blends that uh, the the cellar crew put together on Thursday morning. And then we all convened around the table and tasted those three blends blind against one another. And it's important to note that this whole tasting process is done blind. We know what the variety is, but we don't know which lot it is. I don't want to know that a lot is that Roussan lot that went into the Esprit Blanc last year from the oldest vines in the vineyard. I don't want to know that this other lot is from the fifth pick of these vines that we thought would never get ripe that we picked at 19 bricks. I don't want to know any of that. I just want to know what variety it is and then evaluate it by what's in the glass. So same thing is true for the blending trial. So let me pull out the sheet. So here is the sheet that we did for the Esprit Blanc. So you can see this is all that we know at the beginning is that this is option one, option two, option three. We taste them blind against one another without knowing the percentages um, and then give them, rank them. So at this point, it's not absolute grades. Everything should be a one, we hope. But um, at this point, it's first choice, second choice, third choice. And you see if there's consensus around the table. If there's consensus around the table, you're probably close. If there's not, Maybe you can at least eliminate one option, figure out what it is that people like about the other two that are left and triangulate around an answer for a second or a third round. Now, let me step back a minute here and ask how you come up with these proposed blends in the first place. When you talk about these grapes, you know, Rosan is a very different character. Peak pool is, you know, very, very austere and, and fresh in its way. And then yeah. Rosan has a tendency to be richer and all that. So how do you come up with your, your proposals for the three blends in the first place? So we know that this is a wine that we base around the richness of Roussan. So we know that that's going to play the primary role in this wine. It's not the same, um, it's not the same problem that we're trying to solve with say the Cote de Tablas Blanc or the Patelin de Tablas Blanc. The other blends that we do are based on different grapes and we have a different idea behind them. But for this wine, we know we want to show off the best characteristics of the Roussan from this vintage. Um, and so there are some vintages where it is very much base notes, dense, rich. And so what we're trying to do is give it lift, give it high notes, give it freshness. Um, there are other years where the Roussan is more complete. Maybe it's not quite as powerful. Maybe it's a little more open. Those vintages, maybe we're going to be using something like three quarters Roussan and just add a little bit of Grenache Blanc or Picpoul or Claret, something that's going to give it a little more floral character give it a little brighter acids and just make it a little more elegant. Roussan doesn't need more power. It's always got plenty of power, but it doesn't always have elegance, at least not when it's young. And so one of the main things that we're always trying to do when we're putting the blends together for the Esprit Blanc is make a wine that has elegance as well as richness. And it's interesting, you keep talking about richness, but this wine is 13% alcohol, um, which is you know not a whole lot for anywhere in California, especially <laughs> where, where you are in, in to, in, in Paso Robles, a wine with only 13% alcohol is really quite remarkable. I think that there is a correlation between alcohol and richness, but it is not a one-to-one -one correlation. There can be wines that have tremendous richness and modest alcohol levels. Um, and Roussan is generally a grape that has a lot of texture. It has a lot of weight to it without picking up a huge amount of alcohol. It's, only, it's rarely even at 14% for us. And there are almost always Roussan lots that have density and have texture but maybe 12 and a half alcohol that, that's that's wonderful really i mean because that's i mean for me my my if i was going to design a wine out of the the ether 
to be the wine I want to drink. It's going to be a wine that's intensely flavored, great length and, and, and all that, but it's going to also be lower in alcohol so I can drink more of it. I think Rhone varieties are in many ways the, the grapes to do that with because they have a ton of intensity of flavor. And while some of them can be high in alcohol, there are lots of them that, that are not, and they get really intense flavors at reasonable alcohol levels hmm. in the right places. So now, okay, so you've got these three blends, you come up with your number one, eventually somebody, you, you know, so I, I know how these group things work because I judge wine competitions. So <laughs> somebody's loud and they, you know, they make it work or whatever. But anyway, you come up with your number one. What happens to the rest of the grapes that didn't make this number one blend cut? Right. Okay. So in this case, what we do is everybody, everybody gives it a grade and the, or a ranking and we go around the table and everybody reveals what their what their ranking is in this case five of the six of us had the same one of the three wines as our top choice and the one who didn't had it as his second choice so good enough that's as close to consensus as you get on something like this um so we did that we looked we revealed what the results were which in this case was 60 percent roussan 20 percent grenache blanc 14 percent Picpoul and 3% each Picardin and Claret Blanche. Um, and talked about that first. Like before we went to any, did anything else, we talked about that. And one of the questions that we had was the extent to which, th there was only one of those grapes that using this amount would mean that we wouldn't also have it to do as 100% varietal wine, at least in a small amount. And we feel like that's a really valuable thing that we offer to people is give them the chance to taste Picpoul on its own or give them the chance to taste Grenache Blanc or Roussan or whatever. So the, the question that we had was, is the 3% Claret, does that make a meaningful difference in how good the wine is or not? Because we've only got three barrels of Claret. And if we make, that, I mean, that makes 3% in this wine. And once we do that, we don't have it to do any of it on its own. So we came back and did a second round of testing of that same wine with the 3% Claret and that same wine without the 3% Claret, but with 3% more Roussan. Um, and in that second round, it was universal. All six of us preferred the one without the Claret. Interesting. It was great because it solved two problems at the same time. It made the wine better and it gave us a little bit of Claret to, to bottle on its own. Hmm. What do you, how will you sell that Claret? You've only got three barrels of it. So it's 75 cases. It's not nothing. I mean, that's almost a thousand bottles. So um, we will send a note out to our wine club members and our mailing list and say, hey, we've got Claret. It's probably going to be a limit of three or four bottles a person, and it'll probably be gone within a month. Hmm. Interesting. So it's easier, it's easier to sell that kind of wine then. Um, yeah, at that quantity, absolutely. I mean, we've got We've got 37,000 people on our mailing list. We've got 11,000 wine club members. And when we're talking about something that there's only, whatever, under 100 cases of, if it's tasty and a cool curiosity, it, yeah, it gets snapped up. Right. But with the number of grapes you have, you must have a lot of those little curiosity ones. We do. We space them out around the year. Um, and one of the conversations, I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but one of the conversations that we had um, today was, after we did the Esprit Blanc, and then we blended the Cote de Tablas Blanc, and then we blended the Patelin de Tablas Blanc, um, and looked at how much Roussan that left us, it left us almost 1,500 cases of 100% Roussan. Um, and that's more than we can just send an email out about and have people snap it up. That's, that starts to become like, well, can we sell this to our wholesalers? Is this something that we can market to restaurants? How, how do we, that's, that's not a, um, an in, inconsequential quantity of a, of a wine. So, um, so we ended up uh, having to do a little brainstorming and figure out, well, actually, I think we can make one of the wines better by including an extra couple hundred cases worth of Roussan in that and move a few other things around so that we got our, our quantity of Roussan down to something that we felt like it was reasonable to, for us to sell. But one of the things that people search out Tablas Creek for is to learn about these Rhone grapes that in many cases they, they've only ever seen in blends. So having a good collection of those 100% varietal wines, it's, it's one of the appealing things that people can get if they come to our tasting room or if they're a part of our wine club, it's one of the things that they look forward to. So having that variety, not just of blends, but of the, the varietal components that go into those blends is, is part, of, part of what we try to do each year.
Yeah, I, I, I can relate to that because, I mean, you laugh at me because it's such an obvious thing to do by itself, but I still vividly remember the first time I had 100% Cabernet Franc. Yeah. Um, vividly remember it. Like, wow, this grape could be stand on its own. Um, and, and, of course, it stands on its own all over France. But yeah. uh, I, I was in California, so yeah. you know, it wasn't. How were you to know that? <laughs> yeah. So um, now you did this with the whites today. What happens when will you actually make this? You you propose this blend. When will you actually make this blend? So if this were a normal year, we would we would start blending next week. We it would it would take us probably it will take us about a week's worth of work to turn all of these different individual barrels and tanks into the blends of the finished wines that we decided. Um, but because other than this week when we had really our whole core seller team there, because this is, this is probably the most important part of the winemaking year, um, we're trying to minimize the number of people who are at the vineyard on any given day. We're basically having two of our winemaking team in at a time. So it'll probably take them three weeks to, to turn all of these components into the finished wines and then they'll go, depending on what they are, they'll either go into stainless steel just to settle before bottling or they'll go, if it's the Roussan or the Esprit Blanc, it'll go back into the big 1200 gallon foudres to age for another nine months. Hmm. Now I am curious about, you, 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 you said in the beginning that you don't co-ferment anything, um, but I'm curious if you've ever tried it or thought about it? Yeah, we've tried it from time to time, more with reds than with whites. Um, but we, and the reds are, the, are the, probably the better example of this, but when we've done co-fermentations um, and then we do our blind tastings, we seem never to pick those co-fermented lots for the Esprit. Even if these lot, even when we've tried to say, okay, we know that this Morvedra came from a great part of the vineyard and this Grenache came from a great part of the vineyard, we choose these for the Esprit every year. Let's, we don't have enough to fill up one tank, so we'll put the two together and, and ferment them together. We still don't end up picking those wines for the for the esprit. So we've just come to the conclusion that for us to to feel confident that we're picking the best lots to go into our best wines, um, it's better to wait. That's really interesting because, as you know, a lot of the great wineries of the Rhone Valley yep. do a lot of co-fermenting. It's it's worth noting that our harvest lasts longer than most of the places in the Rhone. We're fully two months from the beginning of the harvest to the end, so you can't co-ferment Syrah and Morvedra. Just doesn't work. Syrah is ready in the beginning of September. Morvedra is not ready till the end of October. One of them is going to be badly overripe or badly underripe if you're trying to pick them at the same time. Hmm. So Moved, if I remember correctly, Moved is the whole reason that your family came to Paso in the first place. Yeah, yeah, I believe you wrote an article about Morved in which uh, which you came to visit for it. Um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, it, the thing about Paso that um, that's I think really noteworthy in an international wine region way is that the growing season here is exceptionally long. Uh, we don't, you don't end up having these end of harvest threats like frost or rain until the middle of November. So if you need to wait on a late ripening grape like Morvedra, you just wait. Um, you're not picking up too much alcohol because at that point the days are like maybe in the 70s and the nights are down in the 30s. So you're getting that last little bit of ripening really slowly. Um, but you're not having to rush it off the vines because there's a storm coming. Um, and it's a huge luxury to have with a really late ripening grape like Morvedra or like Roussan on the white side. Roussan is similarly late. Mm. Yeah, no, I, 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 I really enjoyed doing that article because Morvedra is also one of my favorite grapes. And it's, it's hard to get good Morvedra. There aren't that many places that have, like Paso, Paso's pretty hot in summer. It's, uh, the growing season's long enough and dry enough at the end that you can get all that Morvedra ripe. It is. It's, it's a tricky grape to grow because if you're in a place where it's hot all the time, you end up with the wine, a wine that's kind of heavy and alcoholic. So you need a place that has plenty of heat and has a really long growing season, but where the nights are cold. Right. So um, that's the, the kind of secret sauce to, to Paso Robles is that even in the days where it's 105, the nights are in the 50s. And as you get towards the end of the growing season where the days are topping out in the 70s or 80s, the nights are in the 30s or 40s. So you have all of these hours of cool and the grapevines don't get up to the 68 or 70 degree uh, threshold where they start photosynthesizing until like 10 in the morning or 11 in the morning. So it, slow, it, it lessens the number of hours in which they're photosynthesizing optimally. 
which means you're not picking up quite as much alcohol. Hmm. Well, we're talking about the red, so let's just talk about it. I've got this right here, the 2017 Esprit de Tablas, which is the yes. current. One. And this is, uh, now, whereas this one, this one is 68% uh, Roussant, so a significant amount of Roussant. But this, the main grape is Mauvais, but there's only 40%. True. Yeah, so um, tell, tell me about the making of this one. So it's made in a, in a very similar way um, in that we start with all of the components, taste the components, and then brainstorm on blends and put together the blends starting from the Esprit and then working our way down the hierarchy. Um, the difference is that we feel like um, Grenache, this, it, this is more of a conversation between Morvedra, Grenache, and Syrah than it is a showcase for a single grape. The Esprit Blanc, yes, it's always a blend, but Roussan is really primary in our minds in that wine. And the question is, how much does, how much kind of sculpting, shaping, nudging does the Roussan need to make a wine that we feel like has both, both power and elegance? Um, in this case, um, it's based on Morved. We've used as much as 57% Morved in, the, in the, the most of ever most every year, or as little as 35%. Um, and it's really a question of how strong and how powerful are the Grenache and the Syrah that year, and then what's the Morvedra like? What does it feel like it needs in order to make, again, a wine that has richness and, and balance? Hmm. Well, this, um, is this is a vintage where um, it, the blending was difficult, this 2017, um, because every one of the grapes did well. Um, in some ways, it's easier when you have a grape that's a clear standout. Like 2015, uh, Morvedra was great. Um, Grenache and Syrah were both okay. Um, or whatever, they were good, but they were, not, they were not at the level that Morvedra was. So that was a year where we ended up with 49% Morvedra and quite a bit less of both Grenache and Syrah. Um, 2016 was a year that Syrah was really outstanding. And it was pretty clear that we needed to increase the amount of Syrah that we had in the blend. We ended up with the highest amount of Syrah we've ever used, which was 31%. Because Syrah is kind of a bully. You use too much Syrah, it just takes over. Um, but it was clear that Syrah was, was the real standout in 2016. And so more of it found its way into the blend. We used as much as we could before it started taking over and dominating the other two. Hmm. Um, and in 17, we weren't really sure where this was going to land because all of Grenache and Syrah and Morvedra were all really powerful and rich and had good balance. So um, we ended up tossing this potential blend, this 40% Morvedra, 35 Grenache, 20 Syrah, five Cunois in because that was the blend that we had used in 2014. And we felt like that was the closest recent comp to 2017. So we just tossed it in as a fourth option. We normally, we only have three in our first stage. We decided to toss that in as a fourth. And we had one of those rare moments where around a blending table where everybody tastes it, everybody picks the same wine, and everybody then just stands and sits there looking at each other, wondering what they did wrong. Because <laughs> um, this was not the wine that we expected to pick. Um, and so we spent about half an hour talking afterwards, like, well, what, what could we think that we could do to make this a little bit better? And couldn't come up with anything that we felt like we could do to improve it. So just decided to let the process stand. Now, I am curious about when you're tasting, because... When I'm tasting, I'm tasting basically as a journalist slash critic. Like I want to know how delicious it is, delicious it is right now. But when you're tasting, you're tasting with an entirely different goal in mind, correct? Yeah, I mean we're trying to taste for intensity and balance. Um, those are pretty easy things to to taste for at whatever stage. Um, we're not trying to look for particular flavors, and certainly not trying to look for particular aromas. We know that those will evolve after they're blended, they'll evolve over time in barrel and time in bottle. But if we pick things that have good intensity and good balance between richness and acid and tannin, then we've, we've learned that we'll be happy with the result whenever, whatever the specific flavors are that come out of that. And that comes very much from the experience that the parents have. And they've been doing this now for over a hundred years. They're on their fifth generation and this is the process that they use to put together the wines at Bocastel every year. Mm. So we, we took that uh, pretty much whole cloth from, from them and also took the idea that this has to be done by consensus. 
um, they have nine family members who are involved in these decisions, two brothers and then seven kids of those two brothers. And because it's family, nobody can outvote anybody else. Like nobody just gets to put their, put their, their fist down and say, we're doing it my way. Um, and in the same way, Tablas Creek is a partnership. It's equally owned by us and by the parents. And so neither one of us can say, we're doing it my way, come along. Um, we've got we've to agree on everything. So we came up with the idea that we just have to be around the table and we have to not leave the table until everyone is, is satisfied that we're, we're making something that's as good as we can make. It's interesting because I know, again, judging wine competitions is probably the closest analogy I have to what, what you're talking about. And um, the, the consensus picks, it's, it's hard to get everybody to agree on something. But um, the, the outliers, the ones that somebody loves and somebody else hates, they're always kind of unusual. And somebody either likes it or not. Whereas the consensus ones, you know, they might not be the one that everyone loves in every case, but they're one that everybody would drink. Um, and I guess, that, you know, if you're making, I don't know how many case, thousands of cases you're making them, but that's, that's important. Yeah, and I mean, I think you do want to do, you do want to identify the things that are, for whatever reason, kind of out of the out of the strike zone, like sort of things that you are like that that's really fascinating, but it's not right for this wine. It's not right for this vintage. Not right for this winery. I mean, there's there's times where we'll taste a blend and and say, okay, if we were a different winery, that wine that is super ripe and has more oak. Like that would be something that we might pick, but that's not us. That's not the that's not the right way to put together a wine for Tablas Creek, where we're always trying to let the let balance and let the let the land speak before the winemaking. Hmm. So um, we come at this with a pretty maybe a less diverse set of palettes than um, you might find judging at a wine competition. Where I mean, as a writer, I think one of the things that you one of the really valuable services that you provide to readers is you identify things that you think are wildly interesting and extraordinary. Right. Um, Which somebody else might hate. Somebody else might hate, but that's okay. I mean, you don't need to be picking things that everyone is going to like, and that's kind of boring anyway. Um, for us, I would say we, we probably don't have people who are at the very widest edges, fringes of what they might like. And we do notice that if we try to integrate more than one new person around that table in any given year, it starts to get difficult because people don't necessarily, they haven't yet internalized that they're not just making a decision for their own palates. They're making a decision for the winery in the context of the wines that we've made over 30 years. Um, so we did, this was, this happened most notably six or seven years ago where we had a new viticulturist and a new assistant winemaker in the same year sitting around the table for the first time. And I remember these are both guys who really like these kind of um, zesty, sharp, high acid, um, really high tone, vibrant reds, um, which I love too, but that's not, those aren't the lots that we're picking for the, for the Esprit. So if they're going through and tasting uh, tasting lots and identifying those with the, their top grade because they're the ones that they like the best without the context that those are the right wines for the right lots for this wine that starts to become a problem and I remember sitting around with Neil and my dad at the end of that that first day and having my dad say I don't think this is going to work I don't think these guys get it um, and Neil was like hold on I'll talk to them I, they just didn't come into this with the right context and and uh, sat down with them afterwards and sort of laid out, here's what you're doing. Like, you're, you're not coming at this, you're not thinking about this big picture the right way. Um, yes, you're, you're evaluating for some baseline level of how good is this, but also you have to be thinking how appropriate is this for the wine that, that it's going into. And you know the history of this wine. And uh, when we got back around the table the second day, you could see them thinking both like, here's what I would like me myself here's what i think the right wine is and you could see them sort of gradually overlaying those two ideas and coming into more uh, more balance with the rest of the group and it was it was interesting to watch but it's one of the reasons why we try not to ever have more than one new person around that table at a time
That's interesting. I would imagine that you, I don't know if Neil thought of this, but you must have sent them home with some esprit, uh, some past vintages to taste, so they had an idea of what it was that you were shooting for. The, the thing is, they'd had lots of past vintages of esprit. They just weren't thinking about that as they were as they were tasting. It wasn't like they were brand new. They'd both been at, one of them had been at Tablas for two years. One of them had been at Tablas for like a year and a half, but it was the first year that they had, we felt like they had had enough seniority and enough context to sit around the, the table with us. Hmm. Um, and it was really just a, 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 a mind reset rather than a, oh, they just didn't have the context. They hadn't had these wines before. They'd had the wines before. It was a, it was a question of um, understanding what their, what their roles were. Well, now I've just learned that if I'm ever going to drive down there during blending, I'm not going to be able to push for like a 90% really feel the darkness kind of moped. It's just not <laughs> going to happen. Um, no, probably not. <laughs> I'll just have to have another goal in life. Well, <laughs> Jason, this has been really interesting and I appreciate you sending me the wines. We got some delivery dim sum last night trying to support our local local restaurants. And I, I, I think this is, these are, you know, now that I have both of these open, this is going to be terrific with dim sum. Um, awesome. I love particularly, I think Roan Whites with dim sum are, for me, just slam dunks. Uh, yeah. And, and I can say why. I mean, the complexity of this, um, we've got some foil wrapped chicken, and this is just going to be awesome with that. But the complexity of this, but at, we were talking about the acidity. I mean, I like a high acid wine, and this has a decent amount of total acidity, but at the same yeah. time, it's, it's, very, it's very smooth. Yeah, and that's, that's just it. You, you, Roussan wouldn't work if it were high acid. I mean, there, there are a few outlier examples where it's grown in like the Savoie and the, in the Alps where it ends up a little bit higher acid, but it's not a high acid grape. That's not, that's not how it fits. But at the same time, you can, you can nudge it, you can season it a little bit um, with the other varieties to give, it, to give it a little more acid, still have it be in balance with the, the grape's essential character and um and make something that uh that it couldn't have done on, on its own nor could any of the other components that went into it hmm. all right well before we wrap up i just want to tell people watching that in addition to making great wines jason is one of the best wine industry bloggers um makes me jealous because i'm supposed to be good at that but uh <laughs> you know if you want to read some really interesting in, in, interesting blog posts from somebody in the wine industry you should follow jason on his blog thanks blake um and just so that people know um I will, our, the blog that I'm going to be writing either over the weekend or on Monday is going to be on, on this week's blending process. So if, uh, if people are interested in kind of a deeper dive into how we went about this or what we thought of each of the individual varieties or, or how we came to the conclusions we came to, that's, that's going to be up by early next week. Cool. That'll be up before, by, by, I, I probably won't be posting this before your blog post is up. So people, you see this, you can go right to the Tabs Creek blog and you'll be able to read that blog post. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Jason. I really appreciate you joining me. Thanks, Blake. Okay.